and liftoff of the first United Launch Alliance Vulcan rocket. Well, what do you know? It finally happened. ULA just lit up the first Vulcan rocket with BE-4 engines to orbit. All eyes are now on Tori Bruno and ULA. Congratulations. Everyone is reacting to it, and Tori Bruno also can't hide his emotion. After the launch, yelling out a well-deserved Yeehaw! I am so thrilled, I can't tell you how much. But what makes us very curious about all this is how did Musk's SpaceX and NASA react to this launch? Did Vulcan's success make SpaceX concerned? Let's talk about it in today's episode of Alpha Tech. ULA's first Vulcan rocket successfully reached orbit after lifting off from Cape Canaveral's Pad 41 at the Space Force Station at 2.18 in the morning Eastern. This mission was the first certification flight of Vulcan, an important proving ground for the first launch vehicle developed by ULA since it was established in 2006. The launch was a big one, not just in scale of the vehicle, but also in significance for a market that has become dominated by a single player in recent years. And we both know who exactly that is. It's Elon Musk's SpaceX. Having been delayed by years, the debut of ULA's Vulcan represents the latest challenger to the launch business. Compete Competing against the likes of Elon Musk's SpaceX, with the companies fiercely scrambling for lucrative national security rocket contracts. But does Musk really see ULA's Vulcan as a threat that could steal his livelihood at any moment? The answer is a resounding and definite no. How can I be so confident about this? Well, the first reason is that Musk's response and perspective towards his competitors says it all. After the successful launch of Vulcan, Musk quickly tweeted his congratulations to ULA. Congratulations and to Blue Origin 2. Interestingly, ULA's CEO, Tori Bruno, also promptly responded, saying, Thanks, Elon. It was a good day for Team Space. These two CEOs had a very pleasant conversation. No type of animosity here at all. And honestly, competition is something that should exist in any field. When Vulcan successfully launches, it will contribute to accelerating innovation in human space exploration on Earth. I think competition is a good thing. I don't think it's good to have one provider, Musk said. The next reason is that despite Vulcan's successful launch, it still has many limitations, especially when competing with a rocket line that is already highly reliable. The Falcon 9 has achieved a total of 294 successful launches, with a success rate of 99.3%. Moreover, SpaceX's offering is significantly more economical than ULA's. While there have been discussions about ULA potentially lowering Vulcan's launch cost to a, a, a 100 million US dollars to compete with Falcon, the truth is that Vulcan lacks reusable technology. This is a key factor that space companies are striving for to reduce launch costs. This is not only beneficial for the business operations of space companies, but also promotes innovation in space-based technologies and creates new business models. We must bring in more money than we spend Spend, but maximizing profitability is not really what it is about, said Elon Musk. Undercutting the existing players wasn't so much rocket science as smart business. SpaceX's offerings were designed and built using the most up-to-date technologies, and the company is completely vertically integrated. Unlike ULA, SpaceX makes all its critical components in-house, including its engines. So overall, the success of Vulcan will not cause SpaceX to sweat. It will not make Elon Musk raise any brows, and it will not make the workhorse rocket Falcon obsolete. Also, SpaceX will still have an advantage over ULA once SpaceX's super mega ultra rocket Starship becomes operational. This rocket will have an order of magnitude larger payload capacity than Vulcan and a cost per pound that's much less than even the Falcon 9, said Todd Harrison, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. I don't see any scenario in which Vulcan becomes cost competitive with Falcon 9 or Starship, and a big reason is that it is not designed for reusability. What will keep Vulcan alive is U.S. military policy that says they want to have at least two launch providers and commercial customers that want to avoid becoming dependent on Elon Musk, like Amazon. Once Blue Origin's new Glenn enters service and gets qualified to launch military satellites, all bets are off, Harrison said. But enough about that, let's get back to the launch of the Vulcan rocket 
rocket with its first mission. The goal was not only to successfully place Vulcan into orbit, but CERT-1 was also a historic step in returning the US back to the moon's surface for the first time since 1972. The primary payload on board the rocket was a privately funded robotic lunar lander, which was built by Pittsburgh-based company Astrobotic. The spacecraft was privately constructed and mostly funded by NASA through the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program. The US space agencies paid 108 million US dollars to transport a variety of scientific experiments to the moon, including radiation sensors, spectrometers, and a laser reflector array on the Peregrine Lander. With this commercial program, NASA opted to purchase lunar transportation services rather than build its lander. This approach saved the agency significantly on costs, but also introduced more risks. And it seems luck was on their side initially. After Vulcan successfully deployed its payload into the planned orbit, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson said in a statement on X, Congrats to ULA on the first flight of Vulcan. On board was the Astrobotic Peregrine Lander, which is carrying five NASA payloads as part of our CLPS, or CLPS, launch to the moon. We are showing the power of American innovation and paving the way for future Artemis missions. Astrobotic also confirmed that their ground controllers successfully established communication with Peregrine. All seemed well as the spacecraft entered a high elliptical orbit, preparing to head to the moon in the coming weeks, with the expected arrival on February 23rd. However, the joy of NASA and astrobotics was short-lived as a setback unfolded. About six hours after liftoff, Astrobotic issued an update statement. Despite the craft's avionics systems, including the command and data handling main computer, as well as the thermal control system, propulsion, and power systems, all powering up and functioning as expected, an anomaly occurred. Unfortunately, an anomaly then occurred, which prevented Astrobotic from achieving a stable sun-pointing orientation, the company stated. The team is responding in real time as the situation unfolds and will be providing updates as more data is obtained and analyzed. Astrobotic did not immediately provide additional details about the anomaly. Failure to maintain a sun-pointing orientation could deprive the spacecraft of the ability to generate power using solar panels. The first thing that we're going to do is rotate the spacecraft to make sure that it's pointed at the sun, and then we're going to charge the batteries, make sure everything's correct. John Thornton, CEO of Astrobotics, said in a January 5th interview about post-launch Peregrine activities. In a subsequent update about an hour later, the company said it concluded that the pointing problem is a propulsion anomaly that, if proven true, threatens the ability of the spacecraft to soft land on the moon. It said it developed an improvised maneuver to reorient the spacecraft towards the sun to recharge its batteries and was waiting for its next communications pass to determine if that maneuver worked. And in a thrilling third update, the company said it had confirmed that the maneuver was a success, having reoriented the spacecraft towards the sun so it could charge the battery. The Mission Anomaly Board continues to evaluate the data we're receiving and is assessing the status of what we believe to be the root of the anomaly, a failure within the propulsion system, the company stated about 10 hours after launch. But wait, there's more. In the finale fourth update, the company appeared to rule out the ability of the spacecraft to land on the moon. Unfortunately, it appears that the failure within the propulsion system is causing a critical loss of propellant, it stated. The team is working to try and stabilize this loss, but given the situation, we have prioritized maximizing the science and data we can capture. Astrobotic added that it is assessing what alternative mission profiles may be feasible at this time, but did not elaborate on what those alternative missions might entail. Indeed, exploring space is far from easy, and no one can say they know what's going to happen next. <laughs> the land Thornton said in the pre-launch interview was the biggest risk for the mission. We know we're headed into a gauntlet here. We know we're headed into very difficult territory, he said. At the end of the day, we need to get as much data as we can at every point through the mission so we can learn and get better as an industry. Following such a failure, Astrobotic will, like other space companies, pour over the data from the anomaly. However, analyzing, analyzing this data will take time and should impact its future launch timelines with NASA. The 
next astrobotic lunar lander, Griffin, will launch on SpaceX's Falcon Heavy. The next CLIPS launch is another lunar lander, this time developed by Intuitive Machines. The Intuitive Machines Nova C lander will launch on SpaceX's Falcon 9, and at the time of this recording, Astrobotic is waiting for communications to resume with Peregrine after an expected blackout. Well, that's it for today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Please, let us know what you think in the comment section down below because your feedback is very important to us and helps us make better videos for you. So for that, we thank you so much for watching and hope to see you again next time.